Hi, and welcome to Appalachian Traditions, a virtual discussion of traditional Appalachian craft, music, and dance. I'm Darcy Holdorf, the program director here at the John C. Campbell Folk School, and I'm here on campus today in my office in the Keith House. So thank you to everyone who is joining us. Feel free to say hello in the chat box. Tell us where you are joining from. Um, we have some exciting news here at the Folk School. Um, our January through June 2021 classes are now open for registration. You can find them on our website and in our e-catalog. And we will share some links to that in the chat box. We'll be sharing a lot of new opportunities and links with you today. So if you can't find those links, don't worry. We'll also be sending them in the follow-up email after this program. So we've recently announced a series of workshops, aside from our 2021 classes in the fall, late summer and fall this year, we'll be offering a series of workshops in nature studies, gardening, cooking, basketry, natural dyeing, all subjects that make use of our beautiful gardens and the materials that we grow here on campus. So these workshops will be limited to six students. They'll be held primarily outdoors or in our open air venues such as Open House and Festival Barn. They are open for registration. They open today and you can find a schedule and more info on our blog. I recommend that you take a look and call soon because they are filling up very quickly and we do have limited space. So in case you can't make it in person, we're offering virtual demonstrations by all of these workshop instructors. These will be live virtual programs brought to you from the Folk School campus here in Brasstown. And they'll be covering similar content to what's taught in our in-person workshops, but in more of a demonstration format. Each presentation will be an hour long uh, with a 40 or 50 minute presentation followed by a Q&A with attendees. And we'll also share some links for you to, to look at that. We also have recently announced a series of traditional craft mentorships, bringing small groups of emerging artists to campus this fall for a month of focus study in six subject areas. This is a grant funded program. Um, it is scholarship. So we cover tuition room and board for these students for a month long program. And it may be of interest to some of you because we are offering a month long mentorship in traditional Appalachian blacksmithing where participants have a chance to work independently and also with the guidance of experienced mentors. Um, and we do have also, since this is a woodworking, um, there's overlap between woodworking in this program, we are offering a mentorship on chair making. So we'll share a link to that too. If you or someone you know might be interested, the applications are open and, um, from now until August 28th. So please help us share that. Um, the webinar we're presenting today is part of a grant funded series which aims to preserve and promote traditional Appalachian craft, music, and dance. We're excited to have Jason Lawnen with us today to discuss blacksmithing, woodworking, and traditional tool making. So if this is your first time joining us, just a quick note on how this program works. You do have three icons at the bottom of your screen, chat, raise your hand, and Q&A. And the chat is a place for everyone to interact and, and say hello. Kitty Taylor, our program's operations manager, will be answering your questions and helping out there in the chat. And then you do have the option to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question via audio. If we have time at the end of this program, we may be able to take some questions that way. Um, otherwise, a good way to ask questions is in the Q&A. So if you would like to ask questions of Jason or general questions about the folk school, um, you can put them in the Q&A section and we will get to those in the end. So an example would be, will you be providing a recording of this program? We always get that question. Yes, we will be sending a link to the recording in your follow-up email. So I've invited Paul Garrett today to give us a brief introduction to the folk school, to the blacksmithing program, and to help us introduce our panelists. For those of you who teach or take blacksmithing classes here at the folk school, you probably already know Paul. He's been the resident artist in blacksmithing since 2004. He was instrumental in fundraising and in developing the Clay Spencer Blacksmith Shop, which was established in 2010, and in elevating and promoting the program to one, of the, to one of the folk school's largest and to be recognized on a national level. Um, Paul lives here in Brasstown and has his own studio on campus. Hi, Paul. Hi, thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, 
as Darcy said, my name is Paul Garrett. I'm the resident blacksmith here at the school. And what that means is I, um, I do a lot of work here on campus. Um, I do a lot of my own work as well, but I oversee the blacksmithing program, to make sure that the, all the details are taken care of that help make a, a smooth program. And so one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the more important things I do is help with scheduling and schedule instructors like uh, Jason Lawnen, who we'll speak to in a moment. Um, I found I was fortunate enough to find the place, uh, discover it probably in 1998 or something like that. And uh, I found some time and it came up and took a weekend class in I think 1999 was my first time here. And it was really wonderful. It was April, uh, the campus was in bloom, the weather was perfect, the food was good. Uh, my instructor was just incredible. And so we had a, a great weekend, I had a good experience and it really made an impact um, at the time. I was really looking for something like this and it was just perfect, perfect timing. So uh, one of the things I strive to do now is to make sure that all of our students have that same kind of an experience because I know what kind of a difference it can make in our lives. Um, and so uh, one of the things uh, also I do here is I help with uh, manage uh, groups of volunteers for, uh, you know, work weeks. We do stuff uh, like campus improvements, shop improvements, tools and equipment. Uh, have a great group of people that I've developed over the years that are really talented. We get together uh, once a year and we do a, a week where we just make all kinds of things for the campus. Most of the ironwork you see on campus is done at that time. It's been happening since I think uh, early in the 90s, something like that. So uh, I was really also very fortunate to be here at the time when we were uh, planning and uh, uh, setting up the new uh, blacksmith shop, the Clay Spencer blacksmith shop, big beautiful timber frame building that we uh, began fundraising for in an unfortunate time in 2008, but it went well. People really were behind it. Uh, we got a great response from the blacksmithing community and the folk school community. We put together this beautiful timber frame blacksmith shop, uh, complete with a resource library. We re-outfitted the old shop. Uh, as a support shop for the new and got everything under one roof system. It's been great for us. Uh, a lot more room, a lot safer. I think everyone's just really, really happy with it. Uh, very well equipped. I think it's probably one of the most be best equipped uh, blacksmith shops in the country. And we've uh, actually have an international reach. We've hosted people from Belgium and Germany that have been here and they've really enjoyed the place. Um, so, uh, Anyway, it's been a real special time for me here at the school. I've been here since 2004. I love it. Love the people that come here, the students, the instructors, the, everybody that's involved in the school, the whole music and dance community. It's been really wonderful and it's been a good part of my life. So, uh, and I get to meet all kinds of great people. And I think uh, like Jason Lawnen, for instance, now he's, Jason is going to do our talk today, our webinar. Uh, I have had the opportunity to know Jason now for, I'm going to say almost 20 years, maybe more. I think I met him before. I actually was at the school as a resident artist, but I think we met when I was living near the Charlotte area and we were going to one of the same blacksmithing meetings together. We've known him for a long time. And so it's been really a, a pleasure. Um, I've been uh, watching his career grow and his family grow and uh, the new things he's working on now that he's gonna talk about today is tool making and woodworking and stuff like that. Jason's a really multi-talented individual a great instructor. He's been a great uh, part of our blacksmithing program and woodworking program here at the school for a number of years. We're always happy to have him. Always happy to see him uh, driving across the bridge. So uh, I'll let, I'll let uh, you're here to hear, listen to Jason. So I'm going to turn it over to him and I'm good, glad you're all here. I uh, hope you enjoy this and uh, Jason, it's good to see you. And uh, I'm going to sign off now and turn it over to you and, and see what you have to say. All right. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Well, hello everybody. Um, welcome. I am tickled to be here and uh, appreciate everybody who has signed on to take this webinar and, and listen. I know some of you are friends of mine, some of you are my customers, and, and some of you are folks we've never met before, but we can meet here virtually and I think that's pretty neat. Anyway, um, I am a craftsman and a teacher um, not just by trade, but that's, that's who, who I am in, at, at heart. And I'm really excited to participate in this Appalachian Traditions um, 
series. And it's been a really good experience for me to reflect a bit on, on my Appalachian heritage and how that has affected who I am as a craftsman. It's very profound, not in the sense that a lot of people would think of as in, well, you know, I'm a third generation blacksmith or chair maker or whatever with these patterns and, and, and things handed down. It's not really that way for me. But what was handed down from my Appalachian ancestors was a mindset, an attitude. It was a way of life. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, before we get started, let me just mention or ask uh, Darcy, if you will, kind of keep an eye on the time for me. I don't have a, a clock here on my um, phone. I don't have a separate clock in the shop. So I'm going to try to aim for 30 minutes. But if you'll give me a heads up as we get the 10 minutes and five minutes um, out, we'll try to keep this in, uh, in a good time. Sure, will do. All right. So, um, as Paul said, my name's Jason Lunnan. Um, Lunnan used to be <clears throat> London, and then somebody got mad at somebody else and dropped the D and uh, moved from Virginia to North Carolina. And um, let's see if I can get a screen. Works for me all right. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, we've been here in the mountains of Western North Carolina since the early 1800s. Um, both of my great grandfathers were farmers primarily, but did a lot of other things as well. And that's one of the things that, that was handed down to me. You know, today we think a lot about uh, a career being something you do for an entire, your working life, you do something professionally and then you retire. But you know, both of my great grandfathers uh, were farmers and then did other things on the side. Uh, great granddaddy Hollifield, he never had a real job a day in his life, they told me. He was a farmer, sold produce, did what they, they needed to eat. And if he needed cash money, he'd go work at the sawmill for a day or a week at a time, but never had a, an actual job as you and I would think of a job. My great granddaddy Lennon, um, he was a farmer also, but then in 1916, the great flood washed away his farm. So he had to go work on the railroad. So for several years, he was away every during the week and came on on weekends working on a maintenance gang on the railroad. And as soon as he had enough money, he bought another farm and quit the railroad and went back to farming. And then he kept the store off and on and then he did uh, a variety of other things to bring some income. But it was all, for both of them, it was all centered around the land. It was centered around the home. It was centered around family and getting a living by agriculture off the land. So my grandfather, uh, left the farm and went to school and became an accountant. And then my father, after him, he went to college and became an accountant. And so here I am, second generation, third generation from accountants. But yet my father was an accountant by trade, but a homesteader at heart. And the little three acres that we lived on when I was just a little boy, dad took his chainsaw and cut down a bunch of pine trees and he built a log building, little log cabin to be our barn. He raised chickens and goats and cleared the land off and he built a greenhouse and had a big garden. And uh, then as we children got bigger, we helped out in the greenhouse and we grew tomato plants. And my mother sold hundreds and hundreds of tomato plants every spring right there on the side of the highway. Uh, that's Appalachian tradition. It's, it's a mindset of thrift. It's an attitude of make do with what you have, of being thankful for the resources you have at hand and making the best out of them. So my dad obviously did a little woodworking here and there. He did some, uh, made bird houses and he made different things there for our little place. Um, and I remember as even a small boy on Saturday afternoons, we'd watch the Woodwright shop on TV. We watch Roy Underhill and his hand tools and his boundless enthusiasm just go to chopping away and making something with an ax or an adze or a saw or a chisel or a plane. And it just fascinated me. So as, as soon as I could, I started using a little draw knife and I made myself a shaving horse. And I was always making something and, and my parents encouraged it. Sure, sure, go and go and try making something. So, you know, I started out making little model airplanes and then I made uh, different things out of wood and I made bowls and spoons. And then as I got into my teens for a while. I built flintlock rifles, traditional southern mountain rifles. Um, I was always always making something. You know, I had to be busy with my hands. I had to, had to stay active. So let's take a, a little break from me just uh, running my mouth here. I'll show you one of the favorite things to do. I, I make a lot of adzes, bowl carving adzes these days. 
And I'm gonna show you just a little bit about uh, how to carve a bowl with NADS. Um, over here, you can see some of the bowls that I've made. Um, here's a bowl made out of poplar wood. It's light, it's strong, it's soft, it's easy to carve. It's got everything you want for a bowl. Um, it's a nice little sort of a decorative bowl, putting fruit on the table. Uh, so to start bowl carving, we'll start with a piece of a tree. This is a, a half of a log. I'm gonna lay it on my chopping block. And the rough hollowing we're going to do with a tool called an adze. Now an adze is kind of like a hatchet, only the blade is turned crosswise to the handle and the blade is also, if you can see this, it's curved, kind of like a gouge, like a curved chisel, but it's on a handle and you swing it a lot like a hatchet. So let me demonstrate a bit of this and you can see how we start to carve a bowl. Once we've got that rough initial hollow, I'll come back farther and farther each time, taking bigger chunks out and widening up this rough bowl shape. Then I can come in from the sides You can see how quickly we've got a rough hollow. Now I'm going to show you just a little bit more how not only can this adds be a rough, fast hollowing tool, but it can do some detail work as well. If I, once I get the bowl to the size I want, I'll come back in and smooth it up. And there you see we have quite a hollow just in a very, very short amount of time. So can you see why bowl carving is so much fun? It's just addictive, you know, take a, a rough tool like that adds and just go to town on a log and you start with just a piece of a tree and you end up with something beautiful like a bowl that can sit on your table and can be used back years ago they would use uh, bowls like this. <clears throat> this would be a, a dough bowl. You would use this for mixing your bread dough, biscuit dough in. And uh, just a, a very useful utilitarian piece. It's also very beautiful. So as I grew, I had the opportunity in my mid late teens to work with my next door neighbor. His name was Hugh Bowman. And he was in his 80s by that time. I was a oh, 16, 17, um, and he was a retired, semi-retired. He would, was one of those craftsmen that would never lay down his tools. But he was a furniture maker and a cabinet maker. And he took me on as an apprentice. I worked with him for three years um, until he died, in fact. And it was one of the most formative experiences of my life. Um, Mr. Bowman had grown up on a farm down on the, in the eastern foothills of the, of the Appalachian Mountains. And until he was 21, he told me all he knew how to do was plow corn. When he turned 21, he left home and went to Knoxville, Tennessee to work in his uncle's hat factory. 
But in the evenings, he went to an adult high school and he took woodworking classes and drafting classes and began a career in woodworking. And he worked all over the place, did furniture cabinets um, for many, many years. And um, he was a fine Christian man, a, a real Renaissance man, interested in everything, always learning. He, he was in his late 80s, I guess, when he finally passed, but he was always trying something new. Together, he and I started building mountain dulcimers. Um, he had built a couple of instruments from kits uh, some years prior, and uh, together we, we built oh, some 30 instruments that we sold. I played, my sister and brother played, and we did some recording. Just a, a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, one of the great things about my apprenticeship with Mr. Bowman was he introduced me to detail and taking my time and paying attention to detail and the value of precision. You know, I tend to be a little bit undisciplined and, you know, just get the metal hot and bang on it and, you know, take a tree and then adds and just go to chopping. But Mr. Bowman really helped me to slow down and focus and, and appreciate the detail and the discipline to have uh, precision. So about the same time I started working with Mr. Bowman, I also started blacksmithing. Now, it doesn't really run in my family, uh, but I was always interested in it. So I uh, looked and looked and looked, and my dad helped me look for a long time. Finally, we found an anvil, and I uh, bought a, a little forge, and then I found somebody that had some old coal from a um, home heating stove from years ago. There was a coal pile in their backyard, so I got some coal, and we just started, started working. It was really an uphill battle. It was a lot of work. I, I went to the library. I checked out the entire blacksmithing section, both books. And I read them cover to cover and I went out and, and tried it. And, you know, after struggling along for about, I guess about four years uh, or so, several years I've been smithing, it was getting, getting a little bit better. I thought I was getting pretty decent. I decided I'd take a class. So I signed up for this two week long advanced blacksmithing class at the John C. Campbell Folk School, taught by Bob Becker and uh, with his assistant, Charlie Orlando. And I, I get there and I'm completely over my head. Um, I was the youngest and the smallest. I had the biggest project um, that I was out of my element. Uh, but these guys all took me under wing and coached me along and I survived that two weeks. I came back for another class and another um, really, really enjoyed my folk school experience, uh, meeting some fine, fine craftsmen, some fine blacksmiths. And uh, just continued on woodworking and blacksmithing back and forth. I made cabinets, I made furniture. Um, I made all kinds of different ironwork. I did architectural stuff, you know, small scale railings, gates, little, little things like that, lighting. I did a lot of historic work. I've always been interested in history and I did a lot of reenacting, Revolutionary War period reenacting. So a lot of my blacksmithing was geared toward reenactors, um, hearth equipment, camp equipment, tools for woodworking, uh, 18th century, early 19th century style woodworking. And I've got some of my tools at different museums and historic sites all over the East. Um, but it never did quite settle, you know, did this, that, and the other. And, and I like the variety, you know, looking back at my, my heritage, so, so did my ancestors, it seemed. They did a little of this and a little of that. It didn't really bother them that they didn't have a particular career path. The, the, the point was putting bread on the table in, a, in an honorable way. So, I always enjoyed tools. Tools just, you know, being a woodworker first and then a blacksmith. I started making some of my own tools fairly, fairly early on. And, and obviously they weren't all that great, but it was very satisfying to take a piece of iron, a piece of steel, and make a tool that I would then use to shape wood to make something that was beautiful and useful. Um, that just fascinates me. That whole concept um, is very captivating. And I moved more and more toward making tools, started um, demonstrating at the North Carolina State Fair and the, uh, in the village of yesteryear. It's a wonderful heritage crafts venue. If ever any of you uh, get a chance to go to Raleigh in the fall, of course it's canceled this year, but um, it's a, a wonderful um, heritage crafts collection of, of traditional craftsmen, uh, mostly from North Carolina and the Southeast and a lot, a lot from the Appalachian region. But anyway, they wanted me to specialize. So I said, okay, I'm a tool maker. So I made hearth tools and I made woodworking tools and I made campfire tools and, and did a lot of, lot of different things there, but it was all tool 
related. Um, so how about a, a little, little less just talking? Let me show you the process of making an ads like this. I have a little storyboard to show you uh, the step-by-step -step process of forging this steel ads head. If we look here on my chopping block, I've got this progression. Let me turn, there we go. So I have this progression of how this ad starts out as just a block of steel. In there, just a rectangular block of steel. It's an inch thick and it's an inch and a half uh, wide and it's three and a half inches long. There it is. That becomes an ads. The first step is to punch a hole in it. Now I punch that hole with a punch tool that I made, a little stubby um, sort of rectangular or oval rectangular punch flat bottomed and I punch from one side and then from the other using an antique power hammer that was made in 1951. And that's the first step is punching this um, eye. That's where the handle will eventually go. And it's very important to get that straight. That's, it takes some skill, takes some practice. I still mess them up occasionally. Um, but it's one of those things that just keeps your attention. That hand work, that hand-eye coordination keeps your attention to get it right. Next, I will spread out. Notice this is still rectangular and thick. I'll spread that out just in front of the eye to make what will become the neck of the tool, leaving a little, a little lump of metal at the very end that will become the cutting edge, the blade. And that's the next thing we do. We take that, that lump and spread it out like so. And now we have a piece that's a little over two inches wide out of that little lump. <clears throat> The next thing is I will drive a drift or a shaping tool into the eye and spread the sides of the eye this way to give a little bit um, um, more surface area to grip the handle. And that surface area, that friction between the um, edge eye and the handle is what helps to keep it on. Finally, we have two very critical curves. The first one is the sweep. That's where we take this flat blade and and curve it to cut a hollow. And the second one is this curve in the head. And that allows it to go in and out of a cut and gives sort of determines the range of size of bowl that this tool can carve. So there it is in a nutshell. Um, from a starting block, again, that was um, an inch thick by one and a half inches wide by three and a half inches long and that seems really small but and you look and see how this this block of metal spreads out and becomes this adds fascinating it just keeps my attention all right so where does that that story bring us to today well, like I say, I am a craftsman and a teacher. I've taught a lot of different things. I've, I've taught welding off and on for a long time in the North Carolina Community College system, most recently at Malin Community College in um, Avery County, Newland, North Carolina. Um, I've also taught at the Campbell Folk School, blacksmithing, woodworking. I've taught at the Florida School of Woodwork. I've taught a lot of different um, summer camps and wilderness camp settings um, over the years. But this, the tool making just continued to increase over the last several years, just the, the demand for traditional hand woodworking tools has just gone up and up and up. And it's, it's phenomenal. If you haven't noticed it, look into it, spoon carving, you know, carving um, little wooden spoons for eating with or, or serving or cooking is just uh, uh, all the rage. <laughs> Can you imagine that? There's even a New York City spoon carving club who would have thought that folks in New York City would have a club where they sit around and carve wooden spoons? They do. Uh, in fact, the, the leader of that is a, a, an acquaintance of mine and one of my customers that use a few of my knives there at the club. Um, and I think it's amazing to see this current resurgence of interest in traditional hand tool woodworking. You know, at one time, 
my Appalachian ancestors, this was just a way of life. It was a, a matter of, of surviving even. We had to take things out of the forest, wood out of the forest and make the things that we need because well, either we couldn't afford it or just wasn't available even if we could afford it. Um, so I've been making more and more and more tools. And then a little over a year ago, I left my, my job teaching at the college to go full-time tool making. So now for a little over a year, my sole income has been from tool making. Primarily I make ads, the bowl ads, but also draw knives and spoon carving knives, um, a variety of other carving knives, um, sometimes some gouges, different types of carving chisels, and a fairly narrow range of, of specialized woodworking tools that are hard to find. Um, as the demand has grown, uh, it's, it's been interesting. It's just been really um, hard pressed to make enough high quality tools to even close to satisfy the demand. So I've brought on some help. I started out with one of my best childhood friends named Justin, who um, um, is working with me grinding. I'll do the forging, he does the grinding and finishing. He's an amazing uh, hand and eye coordination with the grinder. You can see line and flow like a few other men I know. And together we've been able to make a much higher quality ads in enough quantity that um, you can get, get some ads out there and folks can, uh, can get their hands on it. There's been quite a, a shortage of certain tools over the last several years. And then uh, a little over a year ago, my brother-in-law, um, Paul, uh, started working with me making the knives, making spoon carving knives and just regular Sloyd knives and carving knives. He's a machinist and a welder. Um, really an inventor at heart um, and it's been really amazing having him help us out. The interesting thing is it's not even really, um, they're not employees. I don't have a great big shop. Um, they each work in their own space but we work together on a unified um, line of, of tools. Kind of like cottage industry, you know the old old cottage industry like the New England sock industry where every family had their sock knitting machine and would make socks and then um, sell them to the sock buyer, took them in, on the market. We, we sort of worked together in that somewhat independent but very coordinated way. And it's been, been very good. And in fact, right now, these tool sales are providing the, the primary income for three different families. So what's just ahead for us? What's right around the corner? I've got some exciting things. I'm, I'm uh, broadcasting to you here from my wood shop on some land that we bought back in January um, from some distant cousins of ours. But interestingly enough, their family bought it 100 years ago from my great, great, great uncle. So this land was in the London family 100 years ago and now back again. Um, right close to where I'm sitting, I will soon be building a, a new blacksmith shop, a little bit larger, a little bit better equipped right now. For the last 10 years, my blacksmith shop's been in a very small dirt floor garage uh, with very few windows, kind of a classic blacksmith shop look, but I'm kind of bursting at the seams. So we'll very soon be breaking ground on a new blacksmith shop here. Um, and one of the things that um, they brought up in this Appalachian Traditions series is, is what are we doing to pass this on to the next generation? And, and there's several things. One, by building this shop, I'm creating a space or providing a space for my three sons to come up alongside of me working and learning a trade so that by the time they're grown, they'll have some marketable skills um, in blacksmithing and woodworking and, and welding. And that's one of the things that I'm planning to do with this shop is passing this on to my sons. Um, and that's worked out really, really well. Um, I saw a question on our agenda, I believe uh, Darcy had, had posed this, I think is really, really worth addressing. And that is, is there, inform is there um, interest among the younger generation in the old Appalachian ways, in hand tool work? And the answer, interestingly enough, is yes. For the last um, eight years, I guess, I taught at um, Mayland Community College and it was a program for high school students. So these were high school juniors and seniors coming from a rural Appalachian County who were taking welding. Most of them were in welding class because they didn't want to go to college and they didn't want to be stuck in advanced math and, and what have you. 
what I found is that they were very willing, many of them that is, very willing to work with their hands and be creative. And it's not so much a historic Appalachian tradition of making a particular reproduction of a particular item, but embracing that mindset of making a living an honest living any way I can with the resources are at hand. One of my students, uh, when I first went to Maitland, was a young man named Liam Hoffman, who, when he was 13, decided he wanted to be a blacksmith. So he dug a hole in the backyard, built a fire, and started hammering on whatever metal he could get his hands on. Um, welding classes helped put him, put him ahead and give him some more um, interest and in, in some more skill and a variety of metal disciplines. But it was interesting to see him and others like him, the younger generation, the, the Gen Z, willing to get dirty, willing to work hard, willing to sweat, willing to discipline themselves and make a living with their hands. And so I see a lot of hope for passing on these Appalachian traditions, especially when it comes to lifestyle. Like I say, the, the lifestyle, the mentality, a thankfulness for our resources, a willingness to use them, and the creativity to take what's at hand and do something useful and beautiful with it. I see my oldest son Isaac coming by here. Hey, come on over and say hi, Isaac. Hi. This is Isaac. He. Uh, just got up from his quiet times eating a snack. Show them what your what your snack is in. What are you, what are you holding your snack in? Hold this up here. That's a little wooden cup, wooden bowl that I carved several years ago. So we've got woodenware that I've made all over the house. Um, use it as gifts. Use it every day on the table. Um, so anyway, what's our time looking like, Darcy? I got to the end of my. You did. Okay, you're doing great on time. Um, we've got plenty of time if you wanted to do a couple more minutes or we could start taking questions now and I've already got some here in the Q&A and some in the chat. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show just a little bit of spoon carving and okay. maybe if you bring through some of those questions, see if there's a, a longer discussion question that might take more than just a yes or no or quick answer and, and we'll kind of dive into there. Sure, that sounds good. One of the one of the main questions is I think some people would like to see your tools. <laughs> oh sure. Well let's um let's let's do that. I'm gonna put a uh, I'll put a line of tools here on the table and we'll talk about a few of them. All right. Let's see if I can turn this a little bit. All right, so I, I have a variety of tools here. I already showed you the ads. Let's take a look again. Sort of a sideways curved hatchet. This has been my bread and butter for the last probably four years. Um, it's not an easy tool to make, as you saw from that storyboard. And there's not a lot of good ones available. And there are many people wanting to carve bowls. So this has been a very, very good thing for us. We're very thankful to be able to make these. And there's so many people interested in them. So an adze is sort of a first cousin to an axe or a hatchet. And I make several different axes, uh, mostly some small and medium sized carving axes. This is my, my latest model. It's a very tiny little axe. I call it a spoon carving axe. And it's um, designed specifically for smaller hands of folks that are carving spoons. One of the things that make a spoon carving or a carving axe different from say a chopping axe if I can get this close enough that you can see, is the bevel is flat rather than convex. So on a chopping axe, you want a convex bevel, and a carving axe, you want a flat bevel, more like a chisel. Um, I am in the process of doing some larger axes. This is a prototype for a small broad axe or hewing axe. Notice that this has an offset eye and an offset handle. And this was used for squaring logs, taking a log and, and squaring it for use in a log cabin or a timber frame type uh, building. 
and I hope to be offering a few of these for sale in the near future. Paul, my brother-in-law, who is um, doing our knives, the two most popular knives we make are, are this one. It's a little sloyd knife for carving knife. Um, we use these in our spoon carving class. And then, of course, the spoon carving knife or hook knife. This tool has a curved blade and it's designed for getting the bowl or hollow of the spoon. So I was just getting ready to show you here. This is a very deep ladle. And this curved knife goes inside of it and carves the hollow. If I can turn this so you have better light. There we go. So I'm, I'm not really watching the chat box, but I did notice a question about steel. I use a variety of steel for our tools. The axes and edges, we're using 4140, um, if that means anything to you. It's a medium carbon, low alloy steel. Uh, it's very commonly available. It's used a lot for axles and things like that. And I find it to work out really, really well for our impact tools. The knives are 01 tool steel. And then our draw knives, we're using 5160, which is a spring steel. So we, we use a variety of steels depending on the application. Is this a tool that needs more um, toughness? Is it a tool that needs more hardness? And we choose accordingly. So Jason, there's a lot of interest in a spoon carving demo if you, if you did want to do that. Sure. Okay. And then we'll take questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. Um, let's see here. Let me grab a piece of wood and I'll show you a little bit. I said jump off my chopping block there a minute, please. So Isaac's learning how to use a knife. And doing pretty well at it. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is take a piece of a tree. And this is a, a piece of maple I've split. I'm gonna split that down just a little bit more. Here we have a nice little uh, rectangular piece of wood. Next step is to rough it out using an axe. And I'll use this little spoon carving axe here. You can see this is starting to look roughly spoon-like.
You're throwing it across the room there. A little longer handle than we need, so I'll just cut this off right here. Right. All right, so that was kind of a lightning fast job, but you see we now have started with a piece of a tree. And we have something that looks roughly spoon-like. Right, it, it does take a lot of folks a lot longer. It takes me longer too. I was in a hurry. And as you can see, we still have a good bit of wood to take off. I did want to show you all three elements though um, in this one little quick demo. So once we've finished using the ax, and if I, I wanted to, I'd take this down farther with the ax, we will next go to the Sloyd knife. I'll start with some pretty powerful cuts with this Sloyd knife. Taking away a lot of material. Jason, we had a question while you're doing this. Can you talk a little bit about the hand strength that a person might need to do some of this carving? Yes, that is a question that always comes up and is very, very worth addressing. Um, yes, it takes some hand strength. Not as much as most of you would imagine. It does not take a power lifter. It does not take someone with a lot of brute force. I mean, I'm a wiry little guy and I don't even weigh 150 pounds dripping wet, but um, I can carve just fine here, you know. A lot of it is technique. And with the ads, I, I didn't explain it as I was carving because it's really hard on these Zoom meetings to talk and chop at the same time. The chopping sound cancels out my voice, but it was not strength, but rather technique. I was sort of throwing the ads, if you will throwing it with a, a snap into the work. And that gives me the, the power. You know, I, if I was simply relying on hand strength, there's no way I could do all this. So we, there are several things about this that make it work. The first one is this wood is green. Okay? I cut this tree down just not very long ago. It's still full of sap. It's still wet and therefore very, very soft. This is so much easier to carve than dry wood. And most woodworkers who are I only think used to- I lost your video there. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's fine. Um, let's, are we back? You're back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right. So by using green wood and carving something soft, it makes it possible. Um, you are not going to carve like this on dry white oak. It just, it's not happening, sorry. It would take way too much strength. But by using green wood, it's a material that is much softer and much easier to work. The next key is a razor sharp tool. It is very important that our tools are sharp. The third element is good technique. And I can't emphasize this enough there's a, a technique that works. And once you practice some hand tool work with good technique, you'll be amazed. You know, people will watch me work and they're like, I tried to use a draw knife one time and 
I thought, man, those old timers, they're crazy. Well, that's because you're using a dull draw knife and you weren't using it correctly. Um, a sharp draw knife and good technique, it's a pleasure to use. I mean, you'll, you'll start carving a, um, a chair leg and pretty soon you'll have a toothpick. You're having so much fun, you've carved it down to there was nothing left. So if this fascinates any of you, I'll be teaching a spoon carving class at the Campbell Folk School in January. I think um, Darcy already put up a link to that. Um, I co-teach that with my friend Hazen Allward. Hazen is a phenomenal instructor, and we've team taught at the folk school for, I don't know, four or five years, I guess. That spoon carving class sells out quick. It's, in fact, it's sold out every time we've taught it. So if that's something that you would uh, like to try, you might want to sign up ahead. It's uh, happening in January 2021. Jason, since you were talking about wood, you've had several questions about what types of wood, and, mm -hmm. and since the wood is green, do you worry about splitting? Yes, so um, first off, type of wood. What we want to use for, we call it treen ware, just like, um, you know, um, uh, earthenware or silverware. This is treen ware because it comes from a tree. We want to use a close-grained hardwood something that's not so oak is open grained you know it's very open grained and it would absorb food and things and just not be so nice so any kind of closed grain hardwood this is maple wonderful wood for carving it's very hard once it dries very strong smooth grain and um, just really nice wood poplar is excellent any of your fruit woods cherry is one of my favorites um, although domestic fruit woods if you can get them, apple, peach, pear, those are all wonderful woods. One of the rules of thumb that I've heard that makes a lot of sense is any tree that has an actual flower makes good tree wear. Cracking when it dries, yes, that is um, certainly a concern. It helps to understand why wood cracks. So what happens is you cut a piece of wood and as it dries, the moisture is leaving it. And a tree, uh, like we humans, has a lot of water in it. Um, I can't quote you numbers or percentages, but a tree is very, very wet when you first cut it. All that sap moving up and down the trunk and through the limbs to the leaves and back to the soil, um, very, very wet. So as it dries, obviously, it shrinks. You know, just like a grape, it dries, it shrinks and shrivels into a raisin. So as wood dries and shrinks, it will often split, especially if it's a big piece of wood, it will split. Now, if we saw it or split it or carve it thin enough, it won't split as it dries, it will warp. So our technique when we're carving green wood, whether it be a spoon or whether it be a bowl, turn this a little bit here, see if we can get a better angle for you to see. Can everybody see that okay? Is that a good? visual. That looks good. Okay. So our technique when we're doing bowls or spoons is to, as quickly as possible, carve it almost to its final shape and thickness. And the goal is for it to be thin enough and even enough that it will then warp as it dries rather than uh, split and crack. And then we'll take some measures to keep it from drying too quickly. So this spoon, I'm not going to set it out in the sunlight right now. I'm going to keep it here in the shop. If I was worried about it, I would bury it in a pile of shavings like wood turners do, or I might put it in a paper bag just to slow down the drying process. And within a few days, it would be quite dry. I'll set it out, you know, on the kitchen counter. And then a few more days, it would be just totally dry and ready for the finishing cuts. I like to go back over my, my spoons and bowls once they're totally dry because carving dry wood leaves a smoother finish. So I'll just go over it lightly with the final finishing cuts and then I'll finish it with an edible oil and then we'll have a, a wonderful piece of tree wear for the table. Jason, could you, you just mentioned you use edible oils. Could you talk about maybe what a few of those are? Sure. Um, one of them is mineral oil. Obviously mineral oil is, is food safe. It's used on a lot of different woodenware. I personally don't prefer mineral oil because it never dries. Um, it's always just a little tacky. Not a problem, it's not gonna go rancid. 
and it's certainly food grade, but I, I don't care for that fact that it doesn't dry. Um, several edible oils would be uh, walnut oil, although some people have nut allergies, so you just need to be aware of that. Uh, another would be pure tongue oil. Now be careful, don't get tongue oil finish or tongue oil based finish, but pure tongue oil is food grade. My personal favorite is flaxseed oil. Now this is the same base as linseed oil. It comes from the flaxseed. Um, however, if you get particularly boiled linseed oil from the hardware stores, wood finish, it has a lot of other chemical dryers and, and additives that you don't want on your on your wooden wood you're gonna eat out of. So I'll go to the health food store or the grocery store and get organic flaxseed oil. So this oil soaks in, but it will dry and polymerize and leave a, a very tough, hard um, finish. It takes a long time to dry. It can take several weeks sometimes, but it leaves a wonderful, wonderful finish. Jason, we're just a few minutes out and I want to be respectful of your time, but we do have a, a couple more questions. Sure. Well, let me lay this, let me lay this aside and see what, what else we have here. Um, did that, did that, hopefully that gave some folks a, a rough idea of how we carve spoons. Yeah, you've got um, a lot of people commenting on your technique. Okay, wonderful. So what, what other questions have we got here? What can I tell you about? So there was one question um, from Tipper Presley. What makes um, a craft traditional, typically Appalachian? So you talked a little bit about that mentality. Right. So there, there's two sides to that. There's the, let's call it the archaeological side to it. And that would be the material culture. You know, the, this is an Appalachian dough bowl. You know, this is a style that was common in the Appalachian region between the years such and such. Um, so there's, there's that part of it. Um, and then there is what I see as more important today is the transferable mindset. So in other words, I wasn't handed down any traditional craft that my father did, my grandfather did, my great grandfather did. It just, it just wasn't, wasn't there. They were, they were farmers and they were, um, you know, laborers and loggers and accountants. And, you know, they put food on the table um, however they could but it was a mindset of, I can do this myself. I can make what I need. And to me, that is traditional Appalachian, is taking what is at hand and making what I need. Kitty or Paul, did you have some, some more questions? I just wanted to say, Jason, I find it really heartwarming and, and how positive to hear your story. So thanks for sharing all the sort of personal touches to your story. You're very welcome, and, and I appreciate your interview questions. Maybe um, if, if I could ask folks to do a raise of hands, how many of you read the blog post um, leading up to this on the Folk School website? Really enjoyed doing that. I'd be curious to know how many of you read it. Oh, yeah. Wow, quite a few so far. And Jason, we've had a few people in here commenting on having some of your tools and how how great they are. So you've got some fans in the crowd here today. Well, good, good. I, I kind of <laughs> figured I would. I know Paul Anderson from Minneapolis is here, um, as well as some others. Thanks, guys. I, I appreciate your your support and your interest in what we do. And you've got about 14 raised hands, and we did share that link. If you didn't read the blog post, it was great. That was. Um, Corey Marie, um, she writes our blogs and she crafted those questions for you. And I thought they were great. Yeah, so if you haven't read the blog post yet, go check it out. It has, it's similar to our discussion today, but has some more, more stories, more information and some, some nice pictures too. And we did get a question about where to buy your tools. I shared your website. Is that the best place to buy your tools? It is, and I'll, I'll briefly um, give you the, the, the rundown on the business side of things for the folks that are not familiar. Um, I don't take orders. I don't keep a waiting list. We make tools in batches, so we'll do a dozen or two or three dozen pieces, and I'll put them on my, web, on my website, um, jasonlonnon.com, and it's a, a full e-commerce website. You can pay with PayPal or credit card, and then I ship the tools to you. If they're out of stock, they're out of stock until we put them back in. Most of our popular tools we're restocking, oh, every three to six weeks. So if it's out of stock, um, it's not, not a, usually a very long wait until it's back in. 
but by not doing a waiting list or orders, it's really cut down on my office time. It's allowed us to spend more time uh, making tools and hopefully in the near future doing more educational content. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, we're going to share a couple things. If you enjoyed this program and you'd like to donate to the folk school, we did share a link to that as well. So please check out Jason's website, take a look at his YouTube channel too. He's got some great resources if you want to learn more and you are doing some online teaching. Is that right? That's right. I'm doing some on the next classes with the Florida School of Woodwork. I'm doing a knife making class. We're going to make a Sloyd knife. We'll start with the knife that Paul made and I'll teach you how to make your own custom handle. Um, we'll also be doing some other virtual classes that, that are not scheduled yet, but we'll be doing more of that in the, uh, in the future. Great. And we also have shared several the link to your class here at the Folk School in January several times. So you can take a look at that and sign up early because it will probably fill. So um, great. Well, thank, thanks everyone again for coming today. It's it, Thank you, Paul, for being here and Kitty for helping out. Um, and I do encourage you to check out the mentorship program in blacksmithing and in woodworking. Um, the applications will be open until August 28th. It's an incredible opportunity for an emerging smith and an artist. And um, um, it is a fully scholarship program. So um, please take a look at that. We shared that link in there. We might throw that in again, just to let you see that. And Jason, feel free to share that as well. Um, and the next, um, the next Appalachian Traditions webinar will feature someone who I believe is a friend of yours, Jason, Marlo Gates. He's a oh, second, yes. Yeah, he's a second generation broom maker from Big Sandy Mush, North Carolina. And we will share his website and a link to his webinar that will be on September 14th at 4 p.m. So we're going to leave the program open for just a, a minute to let people kind of check out some of those links. And again, don't worry if you if you didn't um, click on them right away or you lose them, we'll share them in a follow up email. So, um, and I've got to add this, if you enjoyed this one, you will love to hear Marlo Gates presentation, particularly if you like the, the story of how he became a broom maker. It really um, goes right along with what I've been talking about today and why it's still relevant today. All right. Well, th thanks again. We look forward to seeing you at the folk school in 2021. Sounds great. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Paul. You. Take care. So long. Yes. yes.